Well, we have looked at assuming that K-12 schools take their proportionate share of the cuts, what that translates to in terms of jobs. And assuming you made all of the cuts immediately, midway through this school year, we're talking about about 1,500 teaching jobs and 1,000 jobs for bus drivers, cafeteria workers, um, custodians. Um, that would just be in K-12. Now, K-12 is less than a third of the overall budget when you include um, the, the, particularly the federal funds, that, and with the matching federal funds we get when we spend on health care. So if it's 2,500 jobs, just in terms of K-12 alone, you would expect it, if the other areas of the budget, people aren't making a lot more, and they aren't, then you expect at least 10,000 jobs total. Um, meanwhile, on the other side, I mean, again, the vast majority of corporations are going to be paying $150. That's not going to make you lay anybody off. A few corporations, I mean, like about 1,600 corporations will pay more than two or three thousand dollars in taxes under the alternative minimum tax. That's not going, two thousand dollars doesn't make you lay somebody off. And again, the big tax bills are going to be paid, to the extent they are big, by big out-of-state corporations, many of whom probably have few, if any, employees in Oregon. I mean, Procter & Gamble, how many employees do they have in Oregon? So the job loss claims on the no side are incomprehensible. The job loss realities on the, I mean, if, we, if these measures go down, are fairly obvious. Well, with regard to job losses, there, if there is a, it is a fact that we have lost over 120,000 private sector jobs already. Uh, it is incomprehensible, to use Steve's word, how raising taxes on business when they're already losing money would not result in further job losses. I took econ for athletes in college, and so I'm not the guy you want running numbers. But I will tell you that two, a bunch of economists have looked at this, and you all know about economists. If you laid them all end to end, they still wouldn't reach a conclusion. So I've got mine, Steve's got his. The ones that we're looking to, the, I think their data makes sense, are saying it's going to cost upwards of 70,000 jobs if these measures pass. Now, to the question, a lot of that's speculative. A lot of that assumes that taxing the boogeymen of rich folk uh, won't result in them spending their money elsewhere or won't take their venture capital, you know, that they'll leave the state rather than invest in Oregon. Maybe they'll stay put and tolerate the higher taxes. If I were in that category, I may not. With regard to the C corporations, it is a little bit more direct, and I can't speak for Procter & Gamble, but I can tell Mr. Novick that my clientele, uh, who are in-state companies, who have lost job after job, are going to lose more if these taxes go in. That is a, a fact. On the public sector side, absolutely. There will be job losses if cuts happen. But again, as we've lost that 120,000 jobs on the private side, state employment has gone up. The only growth industry in Oregon, outside of bankruptcy lawyers, is state government. So if there are some job losses to be had in terms of balance, nobody wants to lose a job. I'm not here wishing anybody to lose their job. I want to stop that decline of the private sector job loss, and I think the best way to do that is by defeating these measures. I've got to respond to that business about state jobs going up. Here are the facts. The government is unlike the private sector in one way. When in the recession, private companies mostly lose customers. Government gains customers. They got the same number of kids in school. They got the same number of seniors needing long-term care. They've got more people who are eligible for unemployment. They've got more people who are eligible for Medicaid, more people eligible for food stamps. And also, more people go to college because they can't get a job, so they try to get some, some additional training. So yes, the state added a few jobs in the, un, in the employment office to handle all the flood of employ, unemployment claims. They added a few jobs in the Department of Human Services to handle all the people coming in saying they're qualified for Medicaid and food stamps. And we added a few jobs in the university system because more people were in the university system. Th that is the so-called increase in state government. It's a direct response to the job loss in the private sector. So this idea that the, Mr. Chandler, he said that he was, wasn't going to push an anti-government agenda, but the idea that there's all sorts of extra jobs in the public sector is just silly. Again, what I want to know is how do you get from the vast majority of businesses paying $150 in taxes? How do you get from a couple of, only a couple of thousand businesses paying more than $2,000 in this new minimum tax, how do you get from that to 70,000 lost jobs? 
even if every dollar of taxes translated immediately into a dollar of job loss, which is ridiculous, in order to get to 70,000 jobs, the average job would have to pay $5,200 a year. If that's true, again, we have serious minimum wage violations in this state, and if Mr. Chandler is aware of them, he should bring it up. And the Labor Commissioner's here, so I'd be sure and catch him before he leaves <laughs> the room. That's right, he is. I mean, and also, if you look around the country, low taxes on corporations and rich people is not the key to economic growth. New York has much higher taxes on both corporations and rich people than Florida. New York right now has a lower unemployment rate than Florida. <laughs>